Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a tricky balancing act that Matt has pulled off in this book. Um, it, this is a book that uh, one reviewer called an act of, a perfect act of popular science. And I, I think that becomes more and more important in these days of the Twitter sphere and of people who are willing to pretend they know exactly what the answer is about any number of scientific things. So the, the balancing act you pulled off was, was talking about and teaching you about those kind of uh, situations, but also about telling a good story, because right, we're not going to read it if it's just about antibiotics and it's a textbook. Uh, that was for him to read. Uh, so this, this book really puts you in the, in the footsteps of a physician, a researcher, um, the people in the history of antibiotics, which goes back to World War I. And in the end, there's no answers. And in the end, this is an ongoing struggle. And so uh, to me, I found, that, I found that very fascinating. I think you will too. So let's, let's start with that. Why don't we start with a reading? Well, I hope in the end there are some answers. But uh, you know, before I, I jump into the reading, one thing I wanted to talk about is that many people end up asking me, what is a superbug? And that term, it turns out, is quite controversial. Uh, some people would say it is just a drug-resistant bacterium. And then many other experts would say that's far too narrow of a definition, and that it actually refers to drug-resistant fungi, parasites, viruses. Um, is influenza a superbug or HIV? And if you take a bit of a broader look at what superbugs are and you include all of these drug-resistant microbes, the scope of the problem becomes um, quite concerning. And in fact, the World Health Organization recently came out and said that by 2050, uh, there will be 10 million deaths from superbugs every single year. That's more than heart disease or cancer. And no one's really talking about that, that this is um, quite a pressing issue. And my book is really about how we got into this and what we can do to get out of it. Uh, so I'm going to start with a reading. Uh, well, but before oh, before oh, you yeah. do, now that, you, now that you're asking that, I think it will be important to, to tell people what the, the, your definition of, of what we're going to see in the book is about a superbug. Now, these are, these are bacteria that previously we could stop or bacteria that evolved so That's that we right. now we can't stop them. Yeah, so these are, um, in my own career, I've seen this uh, evolution that I was a medical student at Harvard and you know, being in the emergency room at Mass General, we were often able to treat many of the infections we saw with oral antibiotics, give somebody five days of a pill and send them on their way. And then uh, over the next few years, we saw that those pills weren't working as well and we were often using intravenous treatments. And now that I'm an attending physician in Manhattan, we're seeing that those intravenous treatments aren't working as well. And this is a really scary proposition because, as we'll talk about, um, it's becoming harder and harder to make new antibiotics. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is. So I open the book. I'm going to read a few pages. Just, it'll be a short reading, but it, about what it's like to be a superbug hunter and what's it like to treat a patient uh, who comes in with a drug-resistant microbe. Uh, because this is something that's going to touch many of the people in this room uh, and ended up touching uh, my family as well. It was just after dawn when I felt the buzz on my hip. I broke stride, put down my coffee, and glanced at my pager. I was needed in the emergency room. It was 2014, an unseasonably warm October day, and the text induced a flurry of anxiety and excitement. After 11 years of training, I had accepted a position as a staff physician at New York Presbyterian Hospital, a tertiary care center on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and a patient had just arrived with a perplexing infection, one that had stumped the team in the ER. A moment later, I was standing before a group of medical students and residents and my new patient. The young man writhing in the stretcher was an African-American mechanic from Queens named Jackson, with dark green eyes and a small Maltese cross tattooed onto his neck. He had been shot, and a large area surrounding the bullet, which was still lodged in his left leg, looked infected. As I peered into the jagged edges of the entry wound just above Jackson's knee, a student handed me a piece of paper. The printout revealed the results of a microbiological test which caused my eyes to bulge. My patient, I discovered, was infected with a nimble and aggressive new bacterium that was resistant to every antibiotic at my disposal, except for one, colistin.
I had used the drug only a few times in my career and never with good results because it was so outrageously toxic. Colistin might kill bacteria, but it destroyed kidneys and other internal organs in the process, leaving many of my patients with just two options, dialysis or death. Antibiotics that had proven so effective just a short time ago were now useless, and if I wanted to save this man's leg, it was my only option. I shook my head and handed the paper back to my student. Not good. More than 20,000 people die every year in the United States from antibiotic-resistant infections, and the pipeline of drugs to treat them is always on the verge of drying up. I crouched to meet Jackson's eyes and carefully considered my words. You have an infection, I said. A severe infection. The man's gaze darted from me to the men and women standing in a horseshoe behind me. How severe, he asked. He took in a small breath of air and held it, waiting for me to say something. It felt like an hourglass had been flipped. Suddenly, the tiny room was very hot. I took off my white coat and rolled up my sleeves. Quite severe. His eyebrows raised, and I reflexively extended my arm to hold his hand, but caught myself. I wasn't supposed to touch this patient without protection. I pivoted back to my team. Everybody out, now. I pointed toward the door. I'll be right back. Just outside of the room, I put on a disposable yellow gown and a pair of purple nitrile gloves and returned to the bedside alone. It's very hard to treat, I said, but not impossible. Jackson was now breathing very quickly, on the verge of hyperventilating as sweat beaded on his forehead. He grasped to his thigh, inches above where the bullet had entered. Beneath his fingertips, bacteria were rapidly multiplying, devouring muscle and bone. Am I going to lose it, he asked? The leg? In truth, I wasn't sure. Only Callistin had a chance of destroying the infection, but there were no guarantees. The last person I prescribed it to died 12 hours after she received it. The one before that died while receiving it. I don't think so, I said, as confidently as I could. I squeezed his sweaty hand and tried to imagine how I would summarize the nuances of the case for his wife and children. They would need to take special precautions just to be in the same room with him. We're going to get you through this, I said, as his eyes began to water. We will. I left the room, removed my, gov glove and my gown and gloves, and addressed my team. Start Callistin, I said. One of the residents frowned as she scurried to a computer to put in the order. Then we vigorously washed our hands and moved on to the next patient. So, <clears throat> so let's start with the obvious question after that. And I must say that what I liked about this book is you, you never let go of the fact that you are actually a physician who treats patients as well as a researcher. Right. And throughout the book, we meet more of those patients. Um, but let's, let's go into the question that's, that's you know, the, the, the 2,000 pound elephant in the room, which is uh, why? Right, so the question of why is this young man infected with a drug resistant microbe? And there are um, big reasons for that and small reasons for that. The small reasons for that uh, have to do with individual doctors who are inappropriately prescribing antibiotics, people like me who give out a Z-Pack when we shouldn't, uh, or who you know, give somebody an antibiotic, because we're not really sure and we do it just to be on the safe side. And what happens is every time a microbe is exposed to antibiotics, they figure out what the structure is of that antibiotic and they design ways to destroy them. One of the things that, that bacteria do is they create these things called efflux pumps, which are like little microscopic vacuum cleaners that can suck up an antibiotic and spit it out. And they create these enzymes that chop up antibiotics. So part of it is doctor's fault. Um, the other part is patients. Um, if you were prescribed seven days of an antibiotic and you'd only take two days and you stop it because you're feeling better, that's a problem uh, because the bacteria get just a whiff of the chemical but they don't get completely eradicated, and so they start mutating based on what they've seen. So those are sort of the small reasons. And then there are the big picture reasons, which is that we are using inappropriate antibiotics in commercial agriculture and farming. Uh, there was a front page article in the New York Times two weeks ago about how we're using syphilis drugs and tuberculosis drugs in our orange groves. Uh, I'm from Florida, and I know that the orange groves are important, uh, but they're not that important. And there's a lot of lobbying on both sides for that. Uh, we're also using antibiotics in meat-producing animals, so pigs and cattle and all kinds of uh, chicken. We're cutting back on that now. But basically what happened, and one of the themes in my book, is that there was this extraordinary discovery of penicillin. And then that ushered in this remarkable era where we had all these antibiotics, 
and then we use them in ways that we shouldn't have. And it wasn't until the 1990s that we came to appreciate that we're in this mess and we're only now digging ourselves out of it. And it turns out that digging ourselves out of it is a really complicated venture. And so, you know, I write about those issues, the 30,000 feet issues, but I also, as you mentioned, talk about the patient's lives, because I think that's what so often gets missed in this story. You know, people forward me articles all the time about a new discovery or a new bacterium or a policy proposal, but what's left out are the human beings I'm seeing every day who have infections where we're reaching for drugs that we once would never have used. And I start with this example of colistin because it fell out of favor 30 years ago because it was so toxic. And now we're bringing it back uh, because doctors have to use something. And if you go on social media, as I do, and I see infectious disease specialists like me saying, is anyone else using colistin? It's my only option. Are we really doing this? And that's a, 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 it's hard to believe we're in that position, but that's where we are. And so, you know, I didn't want this to be a book where it's only saying, oh, this is such a, a, a calamity. You know, there are also a lot of people working to solve this. And so I wanted to focus on how we got here and then how we're going to get ourselves out of it. Well, in fact, um, you do a great job in the book showing that the history of antibiotics, beginning with penicillin in World War I and World War II, was always a hit or miss deal until it became sort of the golden age of antibiotics. That's right. So uh, Alexander Fleming, uh, I start one of my historical vignettes with, he was a military physician in World War I treating all of these soldiers in France who were getting shot and were coming into his clinic and they had these infections. And he was using antiseptic fluid and his scalpel because those were really the only things he had in 1914. There were no antibiotics. And he recognized that this was not working. And in fact, these, the antiseptic fluid was making things worse. And so that led him on this course where he eventually discovers penicillin through serendipity largely, but he found it and he partnered with the pharmaceutical industry and, and researchers at Oxford. And that was in the mid 1940s. And that ushered in this era we call the golden era of antibiotic development, the 1950s, where seemingly every month there was a new drug coming out that was extending life, that was radically changing how human beings lived. And then something happened, which is in the 1960s and 70s, a number of prominent scientists came out, Nobel laureates, and said, we got this infectious disease issue kicked. It's time to look at more pressing issues like heart disease and cancer. And so we took our eye off the ball and we started, the pharmaceutical industry started working on these other problems as the bacteria were multiplying and were evolving. And so the 70s and 80s were this period where there were no new classes of antibiotics produced. And that led to a dramatic increase in superbugs. And it wasn't until the 1990s that scientists came out and said, we got a problem on our hands. And as we'll talk about a little bit later, the challenge now is that as experts are coming out saying we need more antibiotics, the pharmaceutical industry is saying we don't make enough money off antibiotics, we're going to do something else. And this is becoming a political issue because there are going to be a number of incentives to sweeten the deal so that big pharma gets back into making more antibiotics. So, so as, well as, as well as the scientific and medical problems here, there is an element of a profit margin problem. The, uh, um, we'll, and like, we'll, get, we'll get to that later, but talk about, uh, and I have to read this uh, so I don't get it wrong, talk about Dabla Vanson and Tom Walsh and your, your research, because you lay it out in the book just like it's a journey. And tell me first, is, is all research done like that? Because it really goes from, the, the, in the book anyways, you really go from seeing a patient to sitting down with this world-class researcher and trying to get something done. Right. Uh, so, yeah, my book is not just a, a history. It's actually about what's going on right in this very moment. And one of the things I discovered when I became a staff physician at New York Presbyterian, I don't know if anyone's ever been there before, but it's top hospital in Manhattan 16 years in a row. And one of the shocking things I discovered is that we were not carrying many of the latest antibiotics. Many, and whatever hospital you go to here uh, or in Boston, uh, most likely does not have the newest antibiotics that have been approved by the FDA. And the reason for that is that the companies who make an antibiotic typically invest a decade and a billion dollars to get their drug approved. And so when they get it approved, they say, we're going to charge a lot of money for it. And hospitals do not have to add any antibiotic to their warehouse, to their shelves. 
And there's something called a formulary committee that decides what drugs to add. And it turns out this formulary committee usually adds the latest uh, cancer drugs and the latest heart disease drugs. But for some reason, the antibiotics are not always added. And so I started, my book is about a trial where I looked at a new and promising antibiotic called Dalbavancin that was fast-tracked through the FDA because it was so great. And then it was approved by the FDA in May of 2014, and nobody was using it. And the drug is made by a company uh, that's based in Dublin called Allergan, and they also make Botox. And I convinced the company to give me a bunch of the drug for free, and I said, let's see what happens if we actually use one of these great new antibiotics um, and see if it benefits our patients and the hospital. The problem is the company charges more than $4,000 for a single dose. And so I consulted with the company, and I said, uh, so I've got a number of uh, comments for you about your drug. Thank you for making a new antibiotic. Uh, you got to cut the price. And they said, thank you very much, Dr. McCarthy. That's the one thing we'll never do. Um, do you have any other feedback for us? And so this, the book is about me trying to introduce a new antibiotic into a world-class hospital and meeting the patients. Uh, imagine if you're one of the patients in the emergency room with a big infection on your leg, and a guy like me shows up and says, hey, I got this new drug. Um, I think it's really great, and you'd be a great candidate for it. And you might say something like, have you ever used this drug before? And I'd say, no. And they'd say, has anyone that you know ever used it? And I'd say, no. Uh, and we'd have this exchange, trying to work through whether or not you would want to participate in a clinical trial. And one of the things, I'm on the ethics committee, one of the things I talk about is the ethical challenges of, of um, performing responsible research. And one person finally, you know, I had this pack of, uh, uh, of information about the drug, and the person said, just tell me this. Would you give this drug to your own mother? And that was such a great question. It clarified so much, and it really cut to the chase of what we were really trying to get at. Uh, and those are the kind of exchanges in the book that I talk about, as well as the, the, the overarching themes of antibiotics. In fact, uh, on, that, on that subject is a point where you treat a man named Mark Simmons. And it is very difficult when you read it to escape the fact that he's terrified. And you can feel his, you can feel his fear on the page. Um, what, are, what are your responsibilities? Because it really seemed like uh, that was a mismatch. The guy in a white coat who who's, doesn't have a disease, and the guy laying in the bed who's horrified that he's going to die from his disease. So what is the other ethical concerns about exploitation in medical research? I mean, and, and how did you address those? Well, uh, yes, uh, tremendous yeah, ethical issues. And one of the reasons I, t I talk about an, uh, a number of ways that doctors have um, acted inappropriately over the decades, whether it's Tuskegee, uh, whether it's injecting mentally handicapped kids with viruses to test out various theories they had. In the old days, physicians were supposed to police themselves. And we quickly realized that that was not good enough. And there are now all of these safeguards and oversight uh, systems and mechanisms in place to prevent a guy like me from walking into the hospital and saying, hey, I got this new uh, herb that I want to test out on people. Uh, and that's important. Uh, but it also can be a thorn in the side of a researcher like me uh, who is eager to try out new drugs. And so one of the um, battles that I talk about in the book is the fight I have with what we call our Institutional Review Board, an IRB that has to approve any clinical research. And they put me through the ringer trying to get me to make sure that what I was going to be studying was appropriate. And the, the trial almost didn't happen for that reason. But once it got approved, it was a tremendous boon for me that the hospital had given a stamp of approval. And so there were, you know, this patient, Mark Simmons, that you talk about, um, he was the first person I ever gave this drug to at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And what I wrestled with is that he gave me consent to do it, but I wasn't entirely sure if it was informed consent. And that's a, a, a slippery slope ethical issue that I'm fascinated by. It, there are people who sometimes will just say yes to whatever I ask of them because they think that's what they're supposed to do. There's a doctor in a white coat who's telling them this may be helpful for them. Uh, and that's a, a responsibility I take very seriously. And it's one that I teach medical ethics to our first year medical students. And I teach an undergraduate survey course in medical ethics. And one of the things that I do is I bring students in to meet with patients. And I typically pick a patient who I think isn't necessarily happy with their medical care. 
and I say, do you want to talk to the students? And they say, yes. And, I, and they said, what, what, what do you want me to tell them? And I say, tell them anything you want. And it's fascinating to flip, you know, I'm, I work at an academic medical center, but to flip the classroom and let the patient be the teacher. Let's, um, let's, let's read some more from your book, uh, and then let's talk about um, how antibiotics in the past were discovered and how they're discovered now. Thanks. So, uh, right there. Yes. So, just think of what I want to do here. So, I'm just going to do a short reading. <clears throat> um, one of the takeaways from this whole issue of superbugs is that there are two very controversial and competing theories about how we got to this position of having drug-resistant microbes. One of the theories that I laid out is that doctors have inappropriately prescribed antibiotics and we've been using them in ways they shouldn't. That gave exposure to the bacteria and they mutated. There's a competing theory uh, that's put forth by a guy named Brad Spellberg. He is one of the world experts in infectious diseases and it was one of the joys of writing this book is that I had access to the top minds in the field. And I'm going to tell you a little bit, just, just a paragraph, but I think it's a fascinating uh, insight into another theory about how we develop superbugs. So Spellberg and his colleagues believe that resistance already exists to all antibiotics, including antibiotics that we have not yet discovered. To understand how this is possible, we might invoke the infinite monkey theorem, which argues that a monkey hitting keys at random on a keyboard for an infinite amount of time will eventually produce coherent text including the complete works of William Shakespeare. By way of comparison, microbes are constantly mutating, hitting the proverbial keys in novel combinations, and those sequences produce enzymes and pumps that can deflect or destroy any antibiotic. Spellberg and his team have noted that antibiotic resistance has even been discovered among bacteria found in underground caves that have been geologically isolated from the surface of the planet for four million years. It's a terrifying thought that called into question the very essence of my trial. I reached out to Spellberg because I valued his skepticism and I thought he might give me the most critical eye. And in fact, he gave me quite a critical eye as we talked about uh, performing the research. And this was one of the, um, the joys, I think, uh, of being an infectious disease specialist. This guy, Brad Spellberg, I saw him at a conference where he got up to the podium like this and he called out pharmaceutical companies by name for the trials that they should have run but didn't because they didn't think it would make them enough money. And increasingly what you're seeing is the doctors pushing back against big pharma. Um, we have, and, and I think we're gonna lead into the question you wanna ask, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll cut this off, but just to say that there is an ongoing battle now between um, the scientists and the pharmaceutical companies that have traditionally made antibiotics and are, are increasingly pulling out. Well, well, let's talk about how antibiotics in the old days, and probably maybe even now. So w when I started reading this book, I, I started surfing around. I don't have a scientific background, so I was doing all I can to keep up. Yeah. So here's, a, here's, here's three bullet points I read in, in a, in a mag, uh, newspaper story. Streptomycin was discovered in a New Jersey field. Uh, Vancosin was discovered in a Borneo jungle and cephalosporins as a class were discovered in a sewage pipe in Sardinia. So talk about how we used to find Yeah, so there are two different ways that you can build an antibiotic or discover an antibiotic. The first is called rational drug design, which is that you can find out what the bacteria looks like on a microscopic scale, and then you can build atom by atom or molecule by molecule an antibiotic that you think will work. That is a tremendously expensive endeavor and it doesn't always work. So that is sort of falling out of favor. And the newer way that we're doing it is that we're simply looking in the dirt. Now why is the dirt or the sewage or the soil so valuable for antibiotics? The reason is that beneath our feet here, there are trillions of bacteria and fungi and parasites that are all in the ground. And they're all engaged in this microscopic molecular warfare where they're creating chemicals that they secrete in the environment around them that where they're trying to kill everything around them, survival of the fittest. And it turns out that some of those chemicals can be turned into dr to drugs and to antibiotics. And so what we're doing now, and there's a lot of research into this,
is figuring out how do you find those molecules? How do you sift through the needle in the haystack to identify the next life-saving drug? And so I write about the scientists who are doing this. And I, I quote one of them who, uh, he discovered this drug in a field in Maine, and it's gonna be one that saves a lot of people. And so I called him and I said, where was the field? And he said, oh, I don't even know if it was a field. And I said, what do you mean you don't know? What, that's what, it, like, all these newspaper articles say it was a field in Maine. He goes, I don't want to know where it is, because whoever's field it was probably owns it. And so this is for my own benefit to not know, so we don't even know. But what happens is the next time you hear about a, uh, a story where there's this new treatment for MRSA, there's a new treatment for some other superbug, the part that people don't always appreciate is what is the challenge of turning that discovery that's in a field in Maine into a drug that could be used for people here? And that process usually takes 10 years of testing in test tubes, in animals, in healthy human volunteers, and then in people with infections who have superbug infections. And so that 10 years usually costs a billion dollars, and it doesn't always work. And the problem is that these companies who make these drugs say, we don't wanna go into this business. We'd much rather make a blood pressure medication where a doctor like me would say, take this every day for the rest of your life. That's a great business model. Uh, an antibiotic, they often lose money. Uh, so the net present value of an antibiotic is negative $50 million. And so companies say, we're gonna do something else. And then guys like me uh, and, and the federal government, the NIH, that often relies on uh, you know, these pharmaceutical companies, were saying, wait a minute, don't, don't give up. And so that has been opening up this conversation of what do we need to do to keep big pharma involved in antibiotic production? Or should we say, Good riddance, we're gonna nationalize the production of this. We're gonna have the federal government be responsible for making antibiotics, and that we should actually look at these molecules like a public good, like electricity or water. That's a very powerful argument that's taking, that's become very popular in England and parts of Europe. And what, I've been, what I believe is that this is one of the most important political decision, uh, discussions that we have not yet had. What will be the, I mean, because it's the federal government, and uh, I can imagine a zillion downsides. So what are some of the obvious downsides? So if you talk to the head of the NIH, uh, he would say, you do not want the federal government to be a pharmaceutical company. Um, these companies have perfected things like distribution and quality control, and they do it very well. And what we should actually do is sweeten the deal for them. And the two types of deal sweeteners that are on the table are called push incentives and pull incentives. So a push incentive is to go to a company like Allergan that makes an antibiotic and say, hey, your corporate tax rate is 20%. Why don't we cut it to 15% if you promise to invest some of your excess profits in new antibiotics? This is a surefire way to pump more money into the antibiotic pipeline. The downside is that we're suddenly giving tax cuts to big pharma, multi-billion dollar companies. Then there are things called pull incentives, which is you say to a company, if you do that billion dollar investment and your drug gets approved, Rather than giving you five years of market exclusivity, we'll give you 25 years. You can charge more for the drug you make. You can make a bigger profit. Again, this will drive up the cost of healthcare, and people would say, I don't know that I really wanna be, you know, we're already not uh, adding many antibiotics to our hospital because they're too expensive. And you're gonna make them even more expensive? So this is a, a big challenge for us, and it's one that we haven't really um, asked many of our political ca candidates about. I would love to hear what Elizabeth Warren thinks about the antibiotic market, or Trump, or any of the people. What are we gonna do? Because experts are sounding the alarm that at a point in our history where superbugs are becoming more common, these companies are losing interest in making more of the treatments for them. And this is a crucial inflection point for us where it's not you know, a, a disaster, but this is an important point in our lives where we can invest in new treatments and we have to figure out strategically what are going to be the right investments. And so I wrote this book so that people would be knowledgeable about this. And so that when a, uh, a politician comes out and says, I got the solution for you to be able to tell, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? This is a little off the, off the beaten track but um, you wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times recently. And um, talk about that, because I, I have always been nervous being around hospitals. Well, I wrote two, so I, I think you're talking about the uh, super, uh, bugs super bugs. And being bugs a, and oh, so this is, this is. My, my grandmother used to say the only reason to go to a hospital was to die. 
that I, I come from an Irish Catholic family that, from Salem, New Hampshire, and I think that's probably the similar uh, feeling that my family has. Um, so an interesting thing happened, which is that my expertise is in fungal infections. And I've been writing and thinking about a fungal infection called Candida auris for years. Nobody really cared. But then it appeared on the front page of the New York Times in April. And I was quoted in the article. And it was this deadly fungus that was resistant to all types of treatments. And they had found it in my hospital, uh, New York Presbyterian. And it had been in the hospitals in New Jersey and in Chicago. And I talked about what it was like to treat a patient with a, a fungal infection for which there was no treatment. And the day after that article appeared, uh, I got a lot of media inquiries. Good Morning America wanted me to come on and talk about this fungus, which I had spent years studying. And my hospital, um, the PR, I got a call from the PR department, and they said, we're going to politely decline this invitation on your, request, uh, on your behalf. And I said, can you do that? And they said, <laughs> they said, we already did. And the reason is that my hospital was terrified of being labeled as infested with superbugs. And what they didn't recognize is that, sure, we saw some patients with this fungus, but we actually cured them. And the reason that we saw these patients is because they got referred into my hospital because we have the experts who know how to treat them. And so I wrote this op-ed where I was essentially calling out my hospital's PR department. And many of the PR departments around the country, uh, there was a patient who died in Chicago of a drug-resistant microbe. And the family said, we'd love to have the hospital comment on this. We're left grieving for our mother and they declined to participate. And so I said that no comment will no longer suffice. And so I wrote this op-ed in the Times where I blasted our the PR department, and I said, this is outrageous. Um, we have more superbugs because we have the most sophisticated diagnostic techniques, we have the most powerful drugs, we have the experts who know how to treat them, and we take patients for whom all hope is lost, and we're taking on difficult cases. And what I found in the, the research of doing this piece is that um, States are obligated to do outbreak, um, uh, outbreak investigations, but they are not obligated to reveal the results of the findings of those outbreak investigations. So the CDC is often very frustrated that they don't have full information. And so I was also calling out uh, these reporting policies because ultimately they think that you all can't handle the truth. That if you knew about all of the uh, drug-resistant microbes in the ho local hospital here, you'd be so scared that you wouldn't even go. And I said, that's not the way to do things. Um, and in fact, what we need to do is respect our audience and be, you know, couple the, the, the transparency and the um, fact that we have these drug-resistant microbes with some education and some uh, explanation. And to say, you know, I show up in the hospital every day and the first thing I do is I go to the emergency room to treat people with drug-resistant infections. And when I go home at night, I'm not worried that I'm gonna be transmitting these infections to my two young kids. And it's because we have containment strategies and we have strict protocols that keep everyone safe, including patients. And so we have to make sure that we're talking about that so that we're not just closing our eyes and saying, hopefully the story goes away, because it's not. I thought it was an excellent op-ed piece. Did the administration talk to you yet again? No, they, you know, it's, it's surprisingly, they did, I don't know what they would have said, uh, but I, I luckily, you know, they said to me, we'd like you to get the approval of somebody in your division before you write another op-ed. Uh, so uh, so it's, what's really fascinating is how this is one of these areas where the hospitals don't know how to talk about this. And so they were very anxious uh, about how I'll talk about superbugs, and the, I'm just going to tell them what I see. So we just got the we just got the high sign that it's getting close to the end, and we should take some questions. Great. Does anybody have? A question? I love questions. All the way back, sir. Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is that there are already incentives for companies to make drugs to treat orphan diseases, which means that they'll never turn a profit on it because it's so rare. Um, there are uh, incentives like this that have just been proposed. Um, if you want to learn more about this, there was bipartisan legislation introduced six days ago. It's called the Disarm Act, and it includes specific incentives just like you've mentioned. And it's one of the rare times where we're seeing bipartisan le legislation to actually spur development 
in antibiotics. Uh, but we're looking at coupling that, um, those incentives, with something called antibiotic stewardship programs. So it turns out that doctors are using antibiotics so inappropriately that hospitals have had to introduce something called an antibiotic steward, which is somebody who approves the use of a drug. So if I say I want to give dalbavancin to uh, my patient in the ER, I have to get approval from a steward who says, wait a second, I looked at the, the case, you could actually use penicillin here, what are we doing? And that's a really important check, but it's very hard being a steward, I've been that person, uh, because you get a surgeon calling you saying, what, what, why are you hassling me? And I'll say, well, actually you're using the wrong antibiotic. And they'll say, who the hell are you? Uh, and so we have to be careful with this, but so the stewardship uh, is part of this disarm act that was just introduced, and it's, uh, I, I'm thrilled to see politicians taking up this issue. Right, so uh, it's a great question. So the question is when you misuse antibiotics, how does this contribute to the problem? So every time a bacterium is exposed to an antibiotic, it can develop, what happens is it wipes out a number of the easily killed bacteria. But if there's one in that population that is inherently resistant, so it will survive and it will continue to grow. And a way to think about this is inside of each and every one of us are trillions of bacteria in our colon. And if you take a course of antibiotics for, say, a sinus infection, that's going to wipe out a certain percentage of the bacteria that are in you. And the ones that are going to survive, some of them are going to be resistant to the antibiotic that you just took. So the more we use antibiotics, the more the resistant bacteria survive and can grow. And so part of it is making sure that we use the right antibiotics at the right time. We want to use the weakest antibiotic, essentially, that we can get away with. And when somebody's really sick, the idea of using a weak antibiotic is not that great. And I've been in those positions where I'm in the ICU and somebody looks like they're dying. And one of the ethical issues I study is if somebody looks like they've got three days to live and they have an infection that just pops up uh, that with a really drug-resistant microbe, do you give that patient one of our precious antibiotics that have just been released by the FDA? And it turns out some doctors say yes and some doctors say no. And the interesting part is they don't always communicate that to the family of the patient. And so this is one of the other areas which I will s save for today, but uh, the ethical implications of how we prescribe antibiotics is also something uh, I'm uh, researching. Sure, right there. So, so yes, and the question is, am I concerned about the quality of generic drugs? You know, I, I balance every answer uh, with the not wanting to be alarmist about these things, but I'll tell you, this specific issue was brought to my attention by my wife, who is in the audience, uh, and she said, are you aware of this? And the truth is that six months ago, I was not aware of this, but it is now something that we're all eagerly trying to correct, and the answer here is that there are these companies that are based in India or China or other countries and they have a New Jersey address and we aren't able to quality control for these drugs. Um, and I, I can tell you that I, now, I saw patients, a, a patient earlier this week who I was wondering if the issue was that they had taken an antibiotic for which the quality was not assured. So this is something, the good news is that we're on top of this and that cracking down on it but it is not something that people were aware of until very recently. So I tell my patients when they go to the pharmacy to ask the pharmacist to hand out this particular drug as a manufacturer to try to get one to make in Europe. I'll be a better thing. And I've also looked around at pharmacies in Europe and looked at the same generic drugs that they have are made in Europe. That's a great tip. I, I, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Oh, so the, the apocalypse question. Um, I, I don't think that we're inching, I don't think that we're there. Um, when I walk into the hospital right now, I feel good about the drugs I have at my disposal. The question is, are we going to 10 or 15 years from now have them? Um, I have found that there are cases now where there is no antibiotic that will work and we have to actually cut the infection out. And that's what happened for this patient that I opened the, the book with, this guy Jackson. The thing he needed was a surgical resection. And that's where we would be in a post-antibiotic world. That's back to the world of Alexander Fleming, where the, the treatment was a hacksaw. And I don't think that we are headed there. I think that there is going to be a solution. We've got a lot of brilliant scientists who are pulling new antibiotics out of the dirt every single month. And the question is, how are we going to get those to patients? They're, the molecules are there, the drugs are there. We just have to figure out how best to study them. We, 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 only, we get into sign and we only have two minutes left. So do me a favor. When I finished reading this book, I, uh, I put it down and I thought, I can't touch anything for the rest of the day. I might get infected. <laughs> I have a bond and I didn't want to walk through the bond. There's got to be a zillion different kinds of bacteria in there. Um, you leave, us with, leave us with a good thought. No, the, 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 the good thought here is that there are, as I write about, there are all of these new antibiotics that are in the pipeline that we are discovering now. And the exciting part is that we're going to be able to cure most infections. The challenge is figuring out who's going to make those drugs and whether or not that should be something our federal government should get involved in. Um, but when I walk into the hospital every morning, I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm not fearful. Uh, and the medical students and the residents who I work with are similarly excited to be tackling these issues. And one of the things I found from my own work, you know, I studied this drug, Dalbavancin, that the hospital said we're never going to use. And I figured out a way to use it that would actually save the hospital money. And they unanimously voted to start using it. And so now we're taking on other antibiotics that we were not using. Um, there were a number approved by the FDA last year, aravacycline, plazomycin, drugs that you haven't heard of because no one's using them, and we're now figuring out how best to use them. So it's a tremendously exciting period to be an infectious disease doctor. All right, well, perfectly done popular science. So this is a terrific book, well worth reading. I want to thank the book festival for having us. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much.